Well, greetings, welcome in. We are so grateful that you chose this opportunity to see our First Grace morning worship celebrations together. We hope that this can be a resource for you in conjunction with belonging to and being known by a local church fellowship. By no means does this substitute that, and we pray that you, wherever you are, would be able to find that. We are so excited about the opportunity to study the scriptures together and we hope that this can be a resource for you. If you have been blessed by the ministries of First Grace as well, you can give back at www.firstgrace.com slash online giving. And we would love to be able uh, to see that investment go forward in ministry. So God bless you. And we hope that you are edified and delight in the scriptures as we study them together today. I was talking to a family member this week and as much as we'd like to do it at times, you can't change who your family is. And all God's people said, can't change who your family is. You might want to. And a lot of times, you know, especially you know, rebellious teenagers, um, kids that are going through transitions and changes in life, you know. You hear stuff said. I've, I've heard young people at times say things to their parents like, I wish you weren't my parents. Worse, you weren't my mom. I wish I had a different dad than you. And somehow you fast forward down the path in life and in my case, my dad went to be with the Lord. And instead of feeling anything like, you know, I wish he wasn't my dad, I wish I could just have one more day with him. Those are the things you wind up feeling. Why is that? It's because relationships are really wonderful. And what we do to steward those relationships really makes a definitive statement about who we are. Today, I want us to continue in our quest to look at biblical families. And I have lovingly called this the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so far, what we've seen is bad and ugly. We're up to part eight, talking about biblical families. And today, I wanna to talk about this whole concept of parenting. Parents, their impact, the things that they define in their children's lives. I've decided to entitle this message, Parents Mark a Path for Your Life. It's just another way of saying that parents have a lot to do with your destiny. What you decide to do, who you decide to become, all the things that you decide to take on Parents have a lot to do with marking the path for each one of our lives. And today we're going to look at the story of Moses and how his parents and those that shaped his life had a lot to do with the path that he finally got on and accepted. We're gonna read from the book of Hebrews today and this is an account that looks back on the life and the experience of Moses. Gives us just a little bit of a brief synopsis, but I think that it's so important. We're gonna get into the actual text of what happened to Moses, a little bit of a thumbnail sketch of his life, and I want you to see what Moses' family really was like. Where did he come from? How did this shape him? Who was he and who did he become as a result of the things he had to walk through in areas of family? We're going to start with Hebrews chapter 11. And if you've got your Bible or in a capacity to get into a Bible app, Hebrews 11 
And we're going to start with verse 23. Hebrews 11, starting with verse 23. And when you've got that, I'd love you to stand to your feet. And we're going to honor the reading of God's word. This is always a good thing. The reason we stand is because this is a, a reverent thing to do. Making sure that we're listening and attentive to God's word. Starting with verse 23. It says, by faith, Moses, parents, hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. Father, I thank you for this profound recounting of the life of Moses and the people of Israel. I pray, Father, that today you'll help us to understand just how big a part family plays in a life and a destiny. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So today we're continuing with our series on biblical families. The story of Moses is a story about an individual who's impacted on all of us. So if Moses has not impacted on your life, you've really not read the Bible adequately and known how pivotal this man's life and his experience has on us. He hand-delivered the Ten Commandments. That's who Moses was. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He emancipated set free the Jewish people from slavery. And despite all that he accomplished, Moses was far from perfect. He had faults and failures just like we do. He started out as a homeless person. And even worse, he was an abandoned baby in the middle of a genocidal holocaust. Moses dealt with the issues of adoption. Many here understand what adoption is, how stressful it can be, how it changes your life. Moses knows the feeling as we look at this account. He was adopted into another family and literally into another race of people. And he was raised in the middle of a pagan idol-worshiping culture, which of course we can find in America right now. He committed murder and treachery as a young man, but was eventually purified by God to lead three million Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. That's a pretty awesome resume, isn't it? All the things that he went through and yet how God used him. What an amazing thing. So we trace Moses' story back to a guy that we studied a few weeks ago named Abraham. That's where all of this dysfunctional family really started when it comes to Israel. Abraham was called by God to leave home without knowing what was gonna come next. God said he would be the father of a great nation. But that was the only assurance that Abraham really had. He believed God and because of that, God led him. He trusted God and God fulfilled his promise. So then fast forward through his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob, 
his great-grandson Joseph, who we talked about last week. Remember Joseph and his famous multicolored coat? Remember, he got that coat because he was Jacob's favorite. And why was he Jacob's favorite? Because he was born of the favorite wife, Rachel. Yep, all that again. All kinds of favoritism, dysfunction in parents, dysfunction in kids. But listen, the Lord was with Joseph. And he ended up becoming second in command in Egypt, like vice president of the United States. In Egypt, he was second in command. He wound up saving his whole extended family plus the nation of Egypt from famine. So fast forward then 400 years into the future and Joseph's family of 70 have now become almost 3 million people living in Egypt. Somewhat overwhelming for the Egyptians. The Egyptian officials feared that the Hebrews would become so strong that they would somehow overthrow the leadership in Egypt. And because they were so strong, it was decided that every newborn Hebrew boy would be drowned in the Nile. So the answer in this situation, as it's been over thousands of years, is when the Jewish people become too prolific, becoming the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky, that we annihilate them, like the Nazis did, like Egypt tried to do, um, it never works. So Moses' life experiences, his family and specifically parents, really affected his destiny. There was a decision made at that time when this Holocaust was being perpetrated on the Jewish people in Egypt that his parents had to make a choice. I want us this morning to look at these scriptures and the life of Moses as we realize that every parenting choice we make, every value we instill and every spiritual investment in a child's life especially is shaping a destiny and a course for their whole life, maybe forever. Moses was definitely shaped by God through his family. So if you've got your first grace today, there are gonna be a few things for you to write down here. And this is gonna be great because as we kind of scroll through Moses' life, I want you to see that the decisions that were made coming from his family had huge repercussions, not just on Moses' life, but on the trajectory of everything that we embrace today in Jesus. Were it not for the nation of Israel, there would have been no Jesus. If it had not been for Abraham, if it had not been for Isaac, if it had not been for Jacob, if it had not been for Joseph, and all of their dysfunctional families, we would not have salvation today in Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? So something awesome can come out of dysfunction. That ought to give you hope like it gives me hope. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, I wanna make sure you're with me. So number one, here's what it says. God protected and raised up a protector in Moses. God protected Moses and raised up a protector in Moses. He was protected as a baby. He was protected by this, by this proactive parenting team. And his mother and father, his mother's name was Jochebed, and she had an idea. And her idea was all about protecting Moses, all about protecting the legacy of her family. This little baby that she had just given birth to would be put to death if she didn't act proactively. We read about this in Exodus 2, starting with verse 1. And we realize that this course of action 
actually shaped who Moses would wind up being. And it wound up that Moses then, in later life, became the protector. And this is one of the things that we were talking about as we were talking about men's ministry. You know, the way that our young men learn to be protectors, they learn to be godly leaders, is by seeing an example of that behavior modeled before them. There's no greater teacher than that. In fact, the old parenting adage is, more is caught than taught. They would sooner do what you do than what you say. And the, the admonition to all of us today is show an example. Show what godly men can be like. And one of those characteristics is being the protector that God has raised you up to be. So as we start reading in Exodus chapter two, this is the actual account of what happened in Moses' life. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, I love the way the scripture says these things, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes, which are like reeds and weeds, daubed it with bitumen and pitch. That would be like a tarish kind of a substance. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister, whose name was Miriam, stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. In other words, Pharaoh's daughter adopted Moses into her family. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. And the name Moses actually means savior drawn from the water. Such a great account. And here we see a picture of who wound up shaping Moses' life for his future. He had proactive Jewish parents. They were part of the house of Levi. And you remember, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob, of Israel. And Levi was one of the brothers that helped to, soul, helped to sell um, Joseph down into slavery, put him in a pit, sold him into slavery, he was complicit in this whole thing. And each one became part of a tribe. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob. And one of these tribes was Levi. This man and his wife were part of the tribe of Levi. And they were the ones who conceived and bore this child who wound up becoming Moses. It was their proactive decision that saved Moses from a sentence of death at the hands of the Egyptians. But they realized also that he was not safe. As long as he was going to be with them, he would not be safe. As long as there was a mindset that Israel's growing population was a threat to Egypt, he would not be safe. So they decided in their proactive kind of behavior to do something that would be outside the box. Do something that could potentially expand the parameters of what their son could be and how he could go on and their family line in the process. So they concocted this idea, making this basket and then putting it in the Nile River. You might say, well, what a fortuitous experience for one of Pharaoh's daughters to just happen to be there by the river and would happen to see this basket and would happen to see that there was a baby in there and would happen to take the baby out of the water and would happen and you go on and on and on. Let's just get that out of the way. This was the sovereignty of God and it would not have happened had God not been in it. He obviously inspired the proactive behavior of parents who were deep in prayer and wanted their children to be really used by God. So here's Moses. 
And the account says, he was a fine child. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that means. Um, I think every one of us who's had children, we, we always think that our children are the most beautiful, don't we? You know, when, when they're born, you know, we look at them and they say, oh, isn't that a beautiful child? And there are beautiful children. There are some fine looking children. But then there are some others that are not so beautiful. Now, you don't, you don't ever want to tell a mother that. You know, you don't ever want to look at a mom who's just given birth and gone through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, bringing new life into the world and say, well, you know, it's not the prettiest baby I've ever seen. Because <laughs> every mom thinks that theirs is the best. Well, we'll just go with that. And I, I guess, you know, since Moses was going back and recounting this story about himself, he was the one who wrote the words that he was a fine child. So he was special on a lot of levels, and certainly that's true. The parents knew he had a destiny on his life. And even though it was going to mean having to let go at a very, very early age, they were willing to do it. it takes faith and trust in God. And of course, God continued to intervene. His sovereignty was still at work. And when Pharaoh's daughter saw the baby, saw this opportunity to have a child, even though she was barren, she looked around and here was the sister monitoring the situation and she said, hey, I know somebody that could nurse this baby. I'm sure Pharaoh's daughter knew she was the true mother. Jochebed was brought to nurse Moses and for these early years of his life, he in essence had two mothers, one that nursed him, his biological mother, and the daughter of Pharaoh who was his adopted mother. Hebrews 11.23 says that this was all a faith venture. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. The edict was to put all of the Hebrew children to death. These parents were not afraid. No matter what the government said and no matter how the government tried to intimidate them, control them, and eventually murder their children. They weren't afraid of that. They were much more concerned about what God wanted in the situation and that's why they acted. So, Moses was protected early on. And then in Exodus chapter three, verse seven, we see that he rose up to be a protector. Exodus three, verse seven says, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. He says to Moses, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So God says, you were protected as a baby, fine child that you were. You were protected for a destiny to be a protector. He was the protection for God's people. He was the one that would preserve the people of Israel. He was the one that would lead them out of bondage. He's the one that gives us a picture today of the fact that we don't have to live in bondage. There's always someone that can bring us out. That someone is Jesus. Perfect type of Christ as we see Moses functioning as salvation protector, defender, deliverer, all of these things. It's a beautiful picture for us today. No matter what it is you're facing, no matter how deep the bondage is, no matter how addicted you've been, no matter how far down you've gone, God says, I'm in the picture to protect you from an even worse destiny. And I've got what you need. And he's willing to protect you. Number two is God prepared a prophet in Moses. God prepared a prophet in Moses. 
And I know he was a reluctant prophet. I have related to Moses so many times as Brenda and I have looked at possibilities of how God would be using us or how God would call us. A lot of times we say, but we we don't feel adequate. We're not worthy to do this thing that you're asking us to do. But God, how are we going to do this? I remember when we started into ministry full time as a family and we had little children and God called us into itinerant ministry. I remember saying, God, wrong number. Call somebody else. I don't even like to take a vacation with toddlers. You know, why would you put me in a car full time on the road with toddlers? Why would you do that? And God was not asking my opinion and he didn't want to know what I was comfortable with. He had a calling and we had a responsibility to answer that call. I'm grateful that we did. In Moses' situation, he said virtually the same thing. Sorry, God, wrong number. There are so many other qualified people and I'm not it. I can't do what you're asking me to do. God eventually said, well, what is it that you've got in your hand? And Moses said, well, this staff, there's what I've got. And God said, well, okay, I'll I'll just use that then. So you've already told me I can't use you. I'll use your staff. You hold that, I'll use that. To many today, and as you're shaping children, as you're shaping relationships, as you're working through family things, a lot of times it's not the super qualified, you know, the people with ability that are the ones God wants to use. He wants to use those with availability. You're willing to do what he wants. And you might say, well, I I just don't know what to do. Well, he'll use whatever you've got. As humbly as you hold it up and say, well, God, this is all I've got. He says, that's what I want to use. I've, I've got that. I'll use that. So this is what pretty much happened as Moses was called to be the prophet of God. Exodus 3, starting with verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? In other words, he's saying, wrong number, I can't do it. He said, but I will be with you and this shall be a sign for you that I've sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what's his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. We just sang about that this morning. He's the great I am. He's not the great I wish I was, and he's not the great I've got my own agenda. He is the answer, the great I am. Because he exists, everything else exists. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, all your dysfunctional family. I just put that in. And the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So the reason I I put that little parentheses in there about all of the people who are named because we've been studying them over the past number of weeks and we realize they all came from dysfunctional families. And the purpose of God happened. Through dysfunction, through problems, through people's idiotic decisions, things that messed up other people's lives, things that were vindictive, things that were treacherous, things that were manipulative, All of those things, God used those things to bring about his plan. Wow. Hebrews 11, verse 26 and 27, gives us another heads up in this passage that we read earlier about Moses. 
he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. In other words, he treasured God and what his plan and purpose was more than anything that he saw in the palaces he was raised in because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt and fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Get a hold of that one for a second. Here's the reason why we persevere in broken family relationships. Here's the reason why we persevere even though we have been given a bad report by a doctor. This is the reason we persevere even though we're ridiculed, accused, and canceled by anybody that we care about. The reason we persevere is because our view of God is more important than anything else in our life. I want us to chew on that one for a second. A lot of times we are so caught up in what other people are thinking and doing and feeling. And then we get all caught up in what we're thinking and doing and feeling. And if we'll just get a right perspective on who God is. So this account about Moses was that he got focused on the one who is invisible. You don't see it with your physical eyes, but by faith, spiritually, you see what the world doesn't see. And you've got a big picture of a big God who's large and in charge, who's gonna work all things together for good to those who love God and are called. That's what Romans 8, 28 says. God prepared a prophet. Prophets are not just raised up in a flash, but this was early days of Moses finding out who he was what his calling was. Many years later in the early church, a man named Stephen, who was one of the first deacons in the church in the book of Acts, he got up and he talked about this account of Moses and talked about the powerhouse that Moses was by faith and all of the things that people tried to do to cancel Moses and to try to get him to take his focus off of that invisible God that he was so focused on and in such close relationship with, it eventually got Stephen stoned for his speech. He was so convicting. In Acts 7, verse 30, it says, Now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him, that's Moses, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush, when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy ground. He had a, vision of God that was righteous, holy, big, and overwhelming. He had spent 40 years being shaped for this role of prophet. He ran from Egypt, you probably remember the story. He murdered an Egyptian that was being abusive to the Jewish people. He murdered this Egyptian. He was involved in a cover-up. Instead of staying to face the music, he ran and he went to the, the area that in this time was called Midian. Today it would be an area of Saudi Arabia that he fled to. And in Midian, he was looking for a place of refuge. He found, guess what? A family led by a man named Jethro. 
If there was ever anybody who needed a family at that moment, it was Moses. His mother, back in Egypt, was still in bondage. She couldn't do anything to help him. Pharaoh's daughter couldn't help him. He had murdered a, a, an Egyptian. There was no help from his family. He wound up on the other side of the desert, helpless, hopeless, looking for help in any way he could find it. And he found this family led by a man named Jethro, who happened to be his new father-in-law. And he married one of Jethro's daughters. And over the 40-year period, they had children, and Moses was shaped for his role to be a prophet. After 40 years had gone by, he finally encountered God and was commissioned into ministry. It's an amazing story having to do with Moses, but look how family figured into all of it. Just when Moses needed it most, he was supported by a family, not just any family, but literally God's family. A man who feared God was raising children to fear God. He found a mate and started his own family, had a wife, had children, and God once again came to shape Moses to be who he needed to be in a family. Number three then, God provided solutions for family problems. So there were some great things that went on in Moses' life in family areas, but in this situation, God had to provide solutions for family problems in Moses. And I'm gonna give you these three kind of quickly. Little letter A is of course what we know about Pharaoh and the plagues. And the reason I'm saying this was a family problem was because Pharaoh was his adopted brother. So this was his brother that he had to go back to and say, God says, let the Jewish people go. Let my people go. He unmasked himself and said, this is actually where I'm from. There was a little bit of a charade. Pharaoh's daughter said I was her son, but actually I'm a Hebrew. Let my people go. God told me to tell you that. <laughs> Pharaoh didn't like it. So, by the time 10 plagues came down on this adopted brother of Joseph, finally, Pharaoh said, I will let the people go. Exodus 12, verse 29 says, at midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh. So this would have been Moses' nephew by adoption that was killed in this, in this judgment of God. It was Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock even. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron, this would be Moses' brother Aaron, by night and said, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, go serve the Lord as you've said. And then we read at the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. That's what it took to get God's will accomplished. Judgment on Moses' adopted brother and his son. The firstborn of Egypt was put to death. And it was because this is Pharaoh's idea. It seems as though when Moses was born in this situation, the answer always is for Pharaoh to kill all of the newborn boys. To lash out against the creation of God. But in this situation, God said, oh, since those words came out of your mouth, that will be the judgment on you. Little letter B, penalties for idol worship that were enabled by Aaron. 
who was Moses' biological older brother. Penalties for idol worship enabled by Aaron. And you might say, well, why was this so terrible and why did this even happen? If you remember the story, Moses led the people out of Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness. They wound up wandering in the wilderness for another 40 years. And you might say, well, why is it that they wandered? Obviously, Moses had just been in the same wilderness for 40 years. Surely he knew the way through the wilderness. Certainly he knew where all the landmarks were and how to get across this barren wasteland. Well, yes, I'm sure he did. But the plan and purpose of God was that Israel would be shaped for 40 years just the way Moses had. Because the furnace of affliction is what shapes us the most beautifully. You want to be shining like gold? Watch out, God's going to turn up the heat. You want to be polished up like fine silver? Watch out. Watch out. God's going to turn up the heat. And that's exactly what happened in Israel. They were, read, they were led through the Red Sea. God parted the waters. There were all kinds of miracles that happened. Great things had happened. But eventually they come to a place where God is about to give his great commandments, wants to give them laws to live by, wants to give them things to guide their lives. The Ten Commandments were the things he was going to hand deliver to Moses. And while Moses was on this holy pilgrimage to get the engraved words of God for the people of Israel, the people of Israel down below rose up and got involved in debauchery. In the process of this, they manipulated Aaron, and Aaron did it of his own free will. But he helped them craft an idol, a golden calf. And we read about this in Exodus 32, where it says, and he, Moses, said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. He's talking to the children of the Levite tribe, the Levites who rose up and said, we will stand with our holy God. And you remember from an earlier message, I said this particular declaration is what took the tribe of Levi into service of the Lord. They were the ones who wound up being the pastors of the temple. This was the stand that they took. As Moses came down and said, what am I gonna do? He threw the tablets down, broke them. He saw all the sin, all the debauchery, all the things that people were involved in. But most of all, false gods, pagan gods, and they wanted nothing to do with God, Yahweh. So Moses said, on the Lord's word, this is what has to happen. So the Levites rose up and they put to death 3,000 men. And here in verse 27, it says, and that day 3,000 men of the people fell. Then in verse 35, the Lord also sent a plague on the people because they made the calf. And then it makes the statement, the one that Aaron made. So there was judgment, there were penalties. Today there are still penalties for worshiping the wrong things in our lives. This is the penalty of idol worship. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, in America, we don't have that kind of stuff. You know, we, we're not worshiping Baal like, like they did, you know, in the Middle East. You know, we're, we're not worshiping those other deities out there. We're, we're not going after these, these other things. And we're certainly not like them. Oh, really? Well, tell me about the things that are distracting you today. The things that you clear your schedule to do. The things that maybe have become idols. Things that you worship. Things that are more important to you than God. Things that have become an absolute consuming preoccupation and obsession for your life. 
A lot of times people will quickly say things like sports. A lot of times people will quickly say things like video games. A lot of times people will say all kinds of things that today afflict our culture. And lest we try to just say, well, that's not me. I think that we've all been touched by these things and we've got to assess on a regular basis who it is and what it is we're worshiping. What is really central? Moses looked at this situation and he realized that in a few short weeks, while he was up getting a clear word from God, the people got distracted and they were willing to go right off a cliff in their attention and worship of other things. Sad situation. And in the process, Aaron, who was entrusted with priestly duties, wound up on the other side of everything that he should have been most interested in. And he wound up building a pagan false idol and was judged by God in the process. It's a good thing he didn't lose his life. But then number three, which is little letter C, and this is the last one. Punishment for a brother and sister who disrespected Moses. Now that brother was Aaron. So Aaron was not done getting dealt with by God. But then also Miriam, this is the same sister who watched over little baby Moses as he was in the bulrushes and said, oh, I know somebody can nurse that baby. Well, now this is Miriam. She and her older brother, Aaron, are teammates with Moses. They're involved in leading God's people together. They're involved in being of ministry together. And it's all of them. And all of a sudden, there's infighting among the family. Here's who God stood with. His prophet. Punishment for a brother and sister who disrespected Moses. Numbers 14, and we're going to fast forward to the book of Numbers. Numbers 14 or I should say 12, Numbers 12. Numbers 12, starting with verse seven. There's a controversy that arises and here's, here's it in a nutshell. We don't know all of the details of this situation, but many have speculated that Moses decided to take another wife. And a lot of people say, well, do you think that the Bible teaches that you shouldn't have multiple wives? Well, it's clear that God raised up a standard in marriage that there was to be one man for one woman. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It's singular. We know that that's God's plan. But... We also know that we have a bunch of dysfunctional families here. And can I just say, every time that a, a man, whether it was Abraham, whether it was Jacob, whoever it was, when they decided to have multiple wives, there was dysfunction all throughout the family. All kinds of jealousy, all kinds of vying for the, the favorite spot. You know, there, it, just problems. Soap opera on every level. And this is what we can plan on when we violate the standard of God. I don't know for sure whether this is actually talking about a second wife for Moses, and it's not clear in the scripture. We can learn some corollary kind of information from the historian Josephus, who has written a lot about these things. Um, it's not infallible like scripture would be, but we do know that Aaron and Miriam were critical because Moses had married an Ethiopian woman. In the text, she's called a woman of Cush, and that area would be Ethiopia. She was African. I don't know if there was racism involved. I'm not sure what they were finding fault with. But they felt like he was off his rocker to have a relationship with this woman. We do know that Jethro's daughter, Zipporah, was his wife. I don't know whether this was another name that she was referred to by, whether she was actually Ethiopian. We don't know all the details. 
but Moses was involved in a relationship that Aaron and Miriam disapproved of. And so instead of trying to work through things, they just disrespected him. They didn't want to follow him. They didn't regard what he was doing as wise. And God had to weigh in on the situation. Now, this is a fearful thing because when somebody is following the call of God and doing what they know is right before God, I don't care if your family, mother, father, sister, or brother, don't get crossways with God. And if someone is clear, and Moses was certainly clear at this point, it says he's faithful in all God's house. God says, with him I speak mouth to mouth, clearly, not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Remember, in one of the earlier points, he became God's prophet. God was communicating with him. He was speaking through Moses. God says he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? He's talking to this brother and sister. Just because they were brother and sister to Moses didn't mean that they were going to get special treatment from God. God said, Moses is the one I'm using. He is my mouthpiece. He's my servant. I trust him. I use him. He's mine. How dare you speak against the anointed of God? How dare you speak against the one who has been anointed by me to lead the people? And he, God is is clear here. Were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? In other words, who do you think you are? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and God departed. When the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous. She was struck with leprosy like snow. And Aaron and Aaron turned toward Miriam and behold, was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when it comes out of his mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, oh, God, please heal her. Please. Can I just make a comment about this today? God had to deal with family issues in Moses' family. But it was God who dealt with it. There may be things in all of our families that God might have to deal with. Let's let him deal with it. Moses did not sit in judgment of his brother or his sister even in the in this situation where he was so outraged about the idol worship and the things that Aaron had enabled, it doesn't say that Moses got in his brother's face and ripped him to shreds. No, that was God's job. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He's the one who keeps the records. He's the one who raises up protectors for his anointed. God is the one who will write the score, even in a family situation that's dysfunctional and not what it should be. So as we come away from this today, we don't know all of the details of everything that went on, but this is just a smattering of things that went on in Moses' family's life. Once again, we're we're coming to the same conclusion every week. If there's hope for Moses... If there's salvation, deliverance, solution from God for Moses, there's an answer for you. God's got what I need. I can look at this situation and realize that God will plead my case. He will protect me. He will come to my defense. I don't have to fight the battle. 
And remember what we said way, way back at the beginning. In Exodus, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Be silent. God will fight for you. God knows who you are. He knows what you need. He knows how to meet your need. So we come away from this today saying, okay, so how do we answer these questions? Like, who am I? Where do I find my identity? Moses had a picture of an invisible God who was big and powerful. Completely in charge, sovereign in everything. The question is, who are you? Are you a pleaser of men or are you looking to God for your approval? Are you looking at what everybody else says about your family and how you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to behave? Are you looking to social media? Are you looking at all these things where you can be canceled and shoved aside and nobody seems to care about anything of value anymore? The question is, where is your identity found? In Moses, it was found in following the invisible God, the great I am. Another question to ask out of this is, why am I here? What is my purpose? What's the purpose for everything that I'm walking through in my life right now? All the things that are wrong and all the things that are good and all the things that are hard to understand and difficulty, maybe physical things, maybe mental, emotional things, times of life, changes, transitions, all of these things. The question is, what is God's purpose in all of that? And basically, in Moses' situation, he could have been asking that question for 40 years while he was being shaped in the wilderness. But no wilderness, no prophet. No pain, no gain. The last question is, what price am I willing to pay to get what God ultimately has for me? What am I willing to discipline myself and sacrifice to receive? What am I willing to press in and find that God wants to do in me as I'm yielded, as I'm disciplined into a, a relationship that's close communication with him, speaking with him, letting his word speak to me, pressing in closer relationship, greater filling than ever before. Moses had to come to a place where he realized I have been shaped for such a time as this. And God said, I need you. I want you to go and bring deliverance. Ultimately, in the end, God used Moses in a very similar way to how he used his own son, Jesus. There was a time in the annals of heaven, in eternity past, where God pointed at his own son and said, I want you to go and be the deliverer. I want you to go and bring salvation. I want you to go and set people free. Make the sacrifice. Discipline yourself for what's about to come. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna be fraught with difficulty. And of course, yes, Jesus was tested in the wilderness before he was able to minister. Tough times before blessing. Difficult moments we don't get right before breakthrough. Don't make the mistake, once again, of bailing right before the breakthrough. 